Welcome to the 2022 Industry Outlook, brought to you by the Washington Hospitality Association. Our presenting sponsor for today's program is United Healthcare. Our speaker sponsor is Adesso, and our event sponsor is U.S. Bank. It's sponsors like you who work with our members every day that make these podcasts possible. Thank you again for supporting the hospitality industry. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you for taking the time uh, to dive into this discussion on our hospitality industry outlook. Uh, before we begin today, uh, I want to give a special shout out to uh, one of our partners, United Healthcare. Uh, United Healthcare is our presenting sponsor, and they offer a suite of different uh, health saving products for our members, especially when it comes to medical. You can save up to 5% on dental, vision, and life as well. Um, to learn more, uh, reach out to myself, reach out to your membership territory manager, or visit wahospitality.org slash member savings slash healthcare solutions. So without further ado, it is my honor to pass the baton to our president and CEO, Anthony Antone. Hey, uh, everyone, welcome to the, to the uh, mid-year uh, industry outlook. Where are we at? Uh, I'm feeling kind of jazzed. As you know, I'm a pretty big data nerd from if you've listened to our prior podcasts or webinars, and we've got three of here with us today. So um, we have uh, Steve Scranton with Washington Trust Bank and uh, their, their economist who writes a great weekly report of what's going on in the economy uh, and really knowledgeable about just the broad economic state of our state and where the region and, and, and area and, and nation are at. Um, and uh, uh, Emmy Heiss uh, with uh, CoStar. Uh, I've got to see Emmy speak. She's a fabulous speaker about uh, where lodging is at and what we're seeing in our occupancy rates and, and ADR and otherwise, and really makes it relatable. Uh, and, and Emmy, I'm, I'm really excited you've joined us here today and that I get to introduce you to the broader industry. And then maybe one of my oldest friends in the industry, even though he's younger than me, uh, Hudson Reilly. Uh, uh, Hudson is the chief economist for the National Restaurant Association. Uh, is it a monthly podcast you do on, on the state of the restaurant economy or weekly, Hudson? It, it's I guess it's monthly. Kitchen. Monthly. And, and it, I always look forward to it. It's really good. Um, and uh, really one of the, the strong advisors to the industry. So the fact that all three of you get to be here today, I can't say thank you enough for. So appreciate that. What we want to do is give each of you about five to 10 minutes to give us an overview in, in, in your view of the world on where we're at with the economy. Uh, if anyone has questions, put them in the chat. And at the end of the three presentations, uh, we will be going through and catching up on where we can expect our economy to go from here or the best knowledge that we're able to answer with at least. Uh, to move us forward and other things we ought to know about the state of our uh, economy as it relates to the industry. So uh, with that, let's start off with Steve. Steve, uh, thanks for joining us here today. And uh, I'm going to turn off our camera so people can focus on you and uh, walk us through uh, where we're at in our economy today. What I wanted to give you is just a quick, like you said, five or seven minute rundown. For those who like the Reader's Digest version, I'm gonna tell you that the economy from a national and a state perspective is still growing, no matter what you may see out of the stock market or some of the media reports, um, but it is very clearly slowing. And I just wanna walk you through why I think that's the case. My view, um, as I look at economies, is I always look through the lens of jobs because my mantra has always been that jobs create income. Income is what consumers have for spending and consumer spending still makes up 70% of economic growth. So what I want to show you here is for the state of Washington, jobs are still growing. Um, we're seeing at various industries, you can see, I just looked at the one month to say, you know, what's been the immediate story with jobs. And you can see leisure and hospitality growing the strongest, but of course, leisure and hospitality was hurt the worst during the pandemic. So um, recovering from that situation. What I'd also tell you is when we think about that, where are you gonna find labor? Cause we always uh, hearing about problems with the, the labor shortage. And I think this graph is maybe shocking for some people cause it's the opposite of what you'd think. The labor force participation rate is simply tells you what percentage of the population is participating in the labor force, either having a job or looking for a job. 
We've seen it declining over time. Everybody says, well, that's the baby boomers retiring. But what I'm telling you with this graph is, if you look at it, the green line, that is 55 and over. I would tell you the baby boomers are not the ones who are dropping out of the labor force. In fact, it looks like they are, in many cases, failing at retirement and having, coming, having to come back to work. Where we're losing the most on this is the young people, the 16 to 19 year olds. You can see the dramatic drop in the labor force participation right there. I recognize some of it is labor laws and things like that, but the bottom line is still, we're losing that as a source of labor as the way this is progressing. So my feedback is, well, where are we gonna find labor then? There's four scenarios that I would say, you know, the US is a country built on immigration. We do not have an effective immigration policy right now. And as a result, we are not getting the benefit from immigration that we may have in the past. I still believe that is a key thing we need to see as the US get a, a effective immigration policy put together. If you don't get immigration, then you have automation um, for many situations where you could use that in the hospitality industry. Um, the other is education. I think there's still a role to spend time with high school kids, with their counselors and everybody, educating them that the hospitality is a excellent career, something that to pursue and break the image for some of them that the only jobs you want is to be a computer programmer. Um, if you don't get that uh, solved there, then you're talking about robotics. And we already see cases of testing of like the uh, robotic arms for flipping hamburgers and things like that. I just think uh, businesses are entrepreneurs. They will adapt. And ultimately, if they can't find labor force, they will do it through automation and robotics. The other thing we need to think about for where are we with the economy and what's going to happen over the next year is interest rates. Very clearly, because the U.S. as a country is um, a net borrower, not a net saver for both businesses and individuals. We know the Federal Reserve is raising rates. What I'm going to tell you is historically, the Fed has raised rates until something breaks. They hope that they break inflation. I think the risk is if they get too aggressive, they break the economy. That's not the case now. That's the risk. The reason why that affects the economy is higher borrowing costs, slow spending, because you're spending more of your paycheck to pay your um, borrowing costs rather than being able to buy goods. So that affects mortgage rates, credit cards, student loans, car loans. It affects small businesses as well, you know, for the hospitality industry or others, is that if you are looking at expansion or other things, um, that may not pencil out as borrowing costs continue to rise. So we need to monitor what happens with interest rates, because that will tell us how much the economy will slow. I call it a recession watch right now, not a recession warning, meaning there's forces out there that if they come together, just like when you get a hurricane watch, there's a storm out to sea, it might develop into a hurricane, might not. That's the story that we have right now. If the Federal Reserve gets too aggressive raising rates, that, that could push the economy into recession. If we see other things that start to go sideways that aren't currently happening, that's when we, I would issue a recession warning then. And I really think that my feedback to people is, it's the consumer that's gonna bring inflation down because consumers, not the US government, they have to cut their spending once they use their other resources. So I think that we will see heading into the second half of the year, consumers starting to pull back on spending and that'll start to bring prices down. The real wild card again is watching the Federal Reserve. If they make a mistake on monetary policy of rating, raising rates too aggressively, that could change the story, or Congress, if they passed any legislation where they're raising taxes, that could also change the story. But for now, I just tell you, growing but slowing, no matter what the media may want to tell you. Anthony, back to you. Steve, thank you so much. That's exactly what I wanted to have you on the podcast today, to, or the webinar today, to bring information. Um, we'll ask questions at the end. Again, if anyone has any questions on economy, where we're going, uh, put them in the chat and we will get to them at the end. Let's switch over to Emmy Heist. Uh, Emmy, I'm so excited you're joining us today. Um, and thanks for everything that CoStar does to support the industry and inform the industry to make good choices. You've been a, a great partner for us and you continue to be. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks so much for inviting me to speak today. And it was great hearing from Steve. I also look forward to hearing from Hudson on restaurant performance. Uh, I'm here to talk about the hotel performance for the state of Washington. Uh, so to get started, I am comparing the hotel recovery performance for the state of Washington to the United States. So on this chart, we're looking at revenue per available room 
REVPAR, just in case there's some people not as used to the acronyms we use. And if you're going to only look at one metric for top line hotel performance, you want to look at REVPAR because it combines hotel occupancy levels and hotel average daily rate red levels into one metric. So here we're looking at the historical trend, and we can see that the state of Washington and the United States are following a similar trajectory in the sense that July showed a strong recovery, kind of flatline. Um, it, it looks like there's a peak in December, but that's just because absolute metrics are lower in December, so it's easier to cross that threshold. Then we see the dip in January due to Omicron, and then we see the industry for the total U.S. and state of Washington picking back up. The other thing you notice uh, very clearly is the dark purple Washington state line is below the United States recovery level. So the state of Washington is, is lagging the total U.S. recovery. So to look at why we need to break down the metrics that make up REPAR occupancy and average daily rate, but also submarket performance. So this particular chart is showing us the trailing 12 month average occupancy. And I did this to smooth the historical lines instead of seeing the ups and downs of seasonality. So before the pandemic, the top occupancy, hotel occupancy markets were the Seattle CBD and the Seattle airports. Um, towards the bottom, which isn't on this chart, were the more rural suburban areas like the Washington State area or Yakima. And then kind of in the middle and in line with each other were Tacoma and Spokane and Bellingham. So then we hit the pandemic, the Seattle CBD and Bellevue more corporate demand generator markets went to the bottom. They still haven't gotten back to the top. And the top performing submarkets are the Bellingham, Spokane, these more leisure destination oriented uh, destinations. And this is in line with total U.S. performance. In general, it's been the leisure visitor that has been driving the recovery, whereas conventions and conferences and corporate travel has been slower to recover. But this trend is finally changing, which is great. So this is just for the month of April. It shows the absolute occupancy level of the submarkets for the state of Washington. So instead of the Seattle CBD being at the bottom, now you can see it's at the fourth place, which is showing that it's growing back up. And so as of March, we started seeing the travel segmentation shift. Um, for the month of April, group occupancy was at the highest level since uh, about February of 2020. So group occupancy is that convention and conference travel. But on not only that, weekday occupancy level was at the highest point um, since the onset of the pandemic, which is indicative of starting to see return to corporate levels. Obviously, with the gray, gray bar, we're not quite there yet in terms of the more urban locations, but the fact that we're starting to see such a strong resurgence, it bodes really well for the hotel market. So I know this is showing April data, our May data is actually processing today, but I did take a look at the preliminary daily data and May is looking to be even stronger uh, than April with the highest occupancy ADR and REPAR seen since actually of October, 2019. So this trend is now a three month trend and really strong for the area. Now jumping to average daily rate, uh, it's showing a different recovery. So here we're seeing every single submarket except for Bellevue has exceeded 2019 average daily rate levels. And this is also in line with US trends where we're seeing average daily rates are recovering faster than occupancy levels are. Uh, something to keep in mind though, this is just showing the month of April. So again, some of the more leisure destinations here have actually been exceeding average daily rate for months, which has been great for the state of Washington. But Seattle CBD, this is actually the first month that rate exceeded 2019 levels. So it's starting to gradually pick up, which is great to see. Another thing that's worth noting, though, is this is not inflation adjusted. So if this was adjusted with inflation, not all of these ADRs would be surpassing pre-pandemic levels. Now, this chart is showing us the recovery only, not in absolute terms. So again, we're seeing these more leisure-oriented 
uh, destination submarkets showing a much stronger recovery. And now this is a percent change. So something to keep in mind is to start off with, it was a lower absolute value. So it's easier to show a higher percentage growth and to make it up. Uh, we're finally starting to see the Seattle CBD with ADR performing, but occupancy is still pretty far behind. But again, it's starting to shift and show a lot of strength, which is really positive for the market. Now, jumping to it all together, this is the RevPAR recovery performance since January of 2021 for the main submarkets, again, comparing to the United States. So Spokane, Spokane and Bellingham are the only two submarkets that are above the total United States in terms of recovery, which is great to see. Um, the other thing I want to point the attention to is the Seattle and Bellevue submarkets, you can see it starting to do this straight up trajectory of recovery, which again highlights, like I said, those segmentations of that business travel is starting to come back, which is really helping. And I know I'm focusing a lot on, you know, Seattle CBD, Bellevue, Seattle Airport. Uh, these submarkets have the most hotel rooms in the state. So, and also are at the highest absolute metrics. So performance of these submarkets really do impact the metrics for the entire state performance. Now, I don't have a slide on this, uh, but I did want to talk about the forecast. So the near-term forecast into the summer is very favorable, very strong. Um, for the entire Seattle market, uh, average daily rate is forecast to exceed ADR levels this year. Occupancy and repar are expected to fully exceed 2019 levels next year. Uh, boating well for the state of Washington is that last week they announced the that the international bidders, visitors no longer have to show uh, testing results to enter the country. So getting that international demand back with one less hurdle will really help the Seattle market, especially from um, the Canadian travelers. Also, uh, this year, there'll be a full cruise season, which will really boost tourism. Last year, it was just a partial cruise season. And then specific to Seattle, really helping the market is the convention center expansion is expected to be completed early next year. So again, it will help induce a lot of that group demand, having that extra space and in a brand new facility. Also, Seattle is hosting the MLB All-Star Game in the summer of 2023. So having that kind of market coverage and free advertising for how beautiful the state and the city is, is always helpful to tourism. So thank you so much. Amy, great job yet again. Thank you so much. Um, this was April's unemployment rates in Washington. May's were announced yesterday, but only for the state and for Seattle. Uh, it dropped another uh, points two uh, yesterday in the announcement for May numbers. We now have 54,000 more people working in Washington than we did in, in pre-pandemic. And it, as you saw in Hudson's chart and, and heard a little bit from Steve, our industry is actually still down right around 20,000 workers, 18,700 and something. Sorry, I don't have all the numbers memorized. Um, so we see this optimism in, in what we hear from all of you, and yet we're competing and trying to bring employees on, competing for wages. As your average operator, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. I just wanted to give this a sense. Um, as your average operator is listening to the economic news and all the people who are trying to panic them. And they're looking at trying to employ people, but they can open for full shifts and generally a positive outlook and this fighting inflation. How do they triangulate themselves between the workforce shortage, inflation, and the broader economic news and where we're headed? Uh, because in my head, I'm like, if everyone has a job, ultimately, they're going to come spend some nights in hotels and take their vacations, which is good news, and they're going to be okay in spending. But there's this other stuff out there in fear. How, how, would, how would you recommend your average operator um, balance that, that information as they lay out their strategy coming up? Steve, you want to start with you? Well, I think the big key is, you know, for our operators and anybody to be communicating that, you know, business is still positive. It is growing because, you know, the biggest problem we've had with the advent of social media is all of the, you know, 24 seven news takes 24 minutes to cover the news and the rest is to keep your attention, which is through negative headlines. And so 
I think that is something, we, you know, even at Washington Trust, we've urged our employees to turn off their TVs when they're working from home and actually focus on their work. And if, if they look around, you know, I, I tell businesses, you know, pay attention to your own environment. And unless you're actually seeing problems developing, ignore the media and focus on, hey, we're still doing fine and let's stay focused on that. So that's what I just say, because, you know, during World War II, you didn't have this kind of media coverage. People just put their head down and worked until we came out of, you know, the situation we're in. I just think, you know, the media and the access to all this stuff is just creating more fear than what's warranted for what we're seeing. Emmy, how about how about you? What would you advise? I mean, we're 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 likely going to see all time record low unemployment next month if this trend continues. Um, we're already at those levels, right? Basically tied with it for at least Washington State. Um, how does that impact uh, what an operator is feeling for for uh, for visitors and travelers and the ability to operate hotels? Yeah, so I'm going to kind of speak more on a like national um, yeah, how absolutely. operators are feeling. So I think what's tough right now is, you know, hotel operators wages have gone way up to try to attract the talent back, but it's still, we're still not where it should be in terms of the employees coming back. It's hard to staff. And I'm sure Hudson could speak to this in a 24 seven business model when you can make potentially more money maybe have better benefits at these tech companies. So that definitely is more impactful in the Washington area, you know, where you can work at the Amazons and the different industrial things. And then I think the other uh, thing to look at is we just saw that rates of hotels are rising. So you have rising rates, less labor, is there less amenities, is there less service? And so I think that's something that operators should definitely keep a handle on in terms of looking at that guest satisfaction and seeing what's going to happen. But there are things being done, you know, they're calling it room refreshes and not full cleans, or if you have to stay for three nights. So it's like, there are things that they're doing. They're removing the paper products out of the room. So there's less staff needed to, you know, turn over a room and, and everything like that. So I think there's some positive headwinds on top of that. I know they're working on getting more visas for um, international employees to come and work at hotels, which is uh, more important at those resort locations. So that can also help those employ employment levels too. So I don't know if I'm necessarily answering the question. It's just what's on operators' minds right now for hotels of things to pay attention to. Well, I think it's going to be fascinating because you look at the people not employed in our industry. I gave the broad number that we're just under 20,000 workers down. The vast majority of that is actually in lodging, even though they're not the largest employer overall within the hospitality industry um, at about 24% lower than 2019 levels. And so how they're gonna adjust is gonna be a fascinating economic watch this summer. And, and as we hit our peak seasons, Seattle and, and the, the beaches. I mean, June, July, August is where you want to visit the Northwest in September. It should be peak seasons, and we got a long way to go to cover that employment gap. The first question is probably for me, um, unless anyone sees this slowing. So uh, the unemployment for the West Coast, uh, CPIW, which is the marker for the minimum wage in these regions, is currently at 8.3%. I don't have a reason to believe that's going to slow between now and the end of September. Does do any of the three of you think that 8.3 is going to slow down uh, in the next uh, three months? No one is saying no. <laughs> I think hotel well, rates are going to continue to go up. So specific to hotels, those will it's we're like you said we're hitting peak season, and that probably contributes to the overall inflation number. Uh, let's switch to a lodging question. Uh, we did get a question about the Portland market, which the Vancouver market is often connected to. Emmy, were you able to find any data on that or is that something we should follow up with later? Uh, I did. Uh, so the Vancouver, you're right. It's combined. It's the Vancouver Portland airport submarket. So obviously it's a little bit of both, but uh, it's really in the middle of the pack. Uh, so if you put it that line with all, everything else I showed in terms of performance and recovery, it's really in the middle. So for April, for example, occupancy for that submarket was 65%, um, and April, 2018 was 71%. So kind of like we're seeing occupancy levels 
for the most part, haven't fully recovered. Um, ADR is surpassing, average daily rate is surpassing pre-pandemic levels for that submarket, which is great. And in April, Revpar was really only a couple cents away from being fully recovered. But again, just right in the middle there. So May marked the third month in a row, which hospitality made direct gains against retail. Um, and I think uh, retail had some higher higher salaries and pay, and, and we had to get competitive within hospitality uh, to meet some of those things. And I think those changes, we're actually seeing people come back that while we were closed for four months and then another four months uh, and people left us for the stability of other industries um, and then didn't come right back when we reopened as our, as our, as our packages, our compensation packages have become more competitive. We are seeing a trend back. It's not all the way back, but I do think that's good news, which means the guest experience during the pandemic isn't sticking as much as I feared it might. So that, doesn't fully answer your question, but but it is something we're keeping an eye on. I think to add to that, to what Steve said, like, yes, I agree. It's unfortunate how um, frontline workers, hospitality, restaurants were treated, you know, during the pandemic when they're showing up to work and trying to make everything happen. It's unfortunate. I think hospitality is trying to highlight the fact now that it is a career opportunity where there is growth within a role. Um, I can even speak from personal experience. I was a night auditor. I worked 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And now here I am presenting with fabulous smart people because there is a career growth trajectory. And I can tell you a ton of people in the hospitality industry have a similar story to mine. And so I think they're focusing on that. And then not only that, when I was working in hotel ops, I got to stay at discounted hotels for places I never would have tried or seen and got that experience that I wouldn't have been able to afford having that type of job. So just to kind of highlight some benefits of working for hospitality, there are perks too. And, and you know, I, I think one of the things we're, we're so dominated by small business, but all of the major hospitality companies now have a tech officer at their C-suite level, which I think is one of those great indicators when you see even this, in theory, the simplest of operations now have a tech op officer at their C-suite level, it tells you we're about to see a tidal wave of new investment levels. And as those major companies make investments and bring the cost down, they're going to be headed our ways. Amy, I know this isn't your necessarily your, your area of expertise, but you talk to lodging operators all the time. Any initial thoughts on technology that you'd want to share? I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but you might have run into something. Yeah, no, I think that there's been a lot of uh, technology advances, especially during the pandemic. Operators had to get smarter to try to get as much profit as they can be. And some of this stuff is going to be sticky. So, for example, just look at room service. It was never a profitable part of a hotel even before the pandemic. And now we have these third party delivery services. So just cutting the room service. Um also, I've heard the same with shuttles. Now we have Uber and Lyft. So now a hotel operator is not paying for, you know, the auto insurance, the upkeep of a, of a, auto, of a van and everything like that. Granted, there's still some properties that are going to have it. Um, and then also with limited staff, the technology of texting, I need towels and having an operator bring it or even the advances of, okay, most people stream their videos now. So make sure we have the technology to set up for that. Do we really need to pay for people to like buy movies and that type of subscriptions because people already have it. So I think those nuances of it's more hospitality utilizing technology that's already there within their hotels. Um, I've heard they're testing doing uh, robotic cleaning, you know, vacuuming instead of, so again, because housekeeping is short staff right now in some areas. So I think that hotel operators are doing a great job of testing different technologies out there to help with profitability and labor shortages. Emmy, uh, bring us a last thought on lodging. We are uh, getting to the point where uh, even though we, we, you're awesome, we, we only have so much time in our day to, to participate in today's call. So give me your, your last thought. If, uh, you want operators to take away about lodging and, and, and where things are going and what that you want them to think strategically on. Uh, I guess I would leave it just with, with the different segments coming back 
between international corporate conference and convention, um, those harder hit markets, CBDs, will continue to grow. Um, if you're more of a resort leisure destination, um, we aren't forecasting a decline by, by any means, but on the other side, it can be those travelers who are going to those domestic leisure destinations are now flying farther away. And so just to be mindful of that, um, I think overall it's gonna be positive, but just with these shifting segmentations, see what who's coming to your hotel and be mindful of those shifts as recovery continues. Uh, with that, I want to thank, uh, our sponsors, um, and, and making this, this possible, uh, and our speakers today, we couldn't do it with, without our sponsors or our speakers and everyone out there. It's an honor to serve you. Uh, we will keep fighting hard and doing everything we can to make sure that 2022 just keeps getting better and we grow into 23 and beyond. So everyone have a great summer. Let's think good thoughts and, uh, we'll go from there. Thank you again to our sponsors, United Healthcare, Adesso, and U.S. Bank, for sponsoring today's program.